Okay, I think it's past the witching hour, seven o'clock, and we will get started. My name is James Major. I'm with Retina Consultants of Texas, and this is our June CE 2021. And what's interesting about this is this is cases referred by you. So these are cases that eye care professionals here in greater Houston have sent to us via fax or the image portal or maybe a phone call, and then what we did with them, the diagnosis and management of these retinal conditions, uh, which are very interesting. So there's three presenters tonight, uh, three presenters tonight Dr. Chin, uh, Dr. Wynn, and then uh, Chris Henry will be last. Next slide, please. Here are the, here we are, Retina Consultants of, of Texas, and here we are. So if you remember, we were Retina Consultants of Houston. We got a little too big for our britches, and we sort of have offices in Lufkin and Livingston, as you'll see on the next map. So we are now Retina Consultants of Texas, complete with a new name change and a new logo, but our care, our patient care, our research, our doctors, all basically the same. So you'll see a lot of familiar faces like Dr. Brown and Dr. Wong, Dr. Benz, Dr. Kim and Fish, um, some newer faces, Dr. Uh, Wynn, who will present tonight, and Dr. Patel, uh, also Ankur Shaw, Dr. Wyckoff, Dr. Scheffler, who is our ocular oncologist. We have three uveitis specialists in this group. Dr. Henry, Dr. Kim, Dr. Larkin, all do uveitis. I'm in the middle, Dr. Major, and I think I got everybody, but those are our doctors, many of whom you already know. Uh, next slide, please. So uh, again, this, uh, this CE tonight is sponsored by the Greater Houston Retina Research Foundation. This again is a 501c3 nonprofit organization that sponsors this CE. And that is our research uh, and foundation arm. So it promotes education research related to, to anything retina. Uh, donations to this for foundation are tax deductible and we get solicitations from professional college patients and families um, hopefully give. And again, this is a separate uh, funded institution than Retina Consultants of Texas, our clinical entity and our surgical entity. So they're completely separate financially, which is wonderful. Uh, next slide, please. Here's a map of Houston. You know our locations, but here they are. If you basically throw a dart anywhere, you're gonna find a map. Um, I'll sort of highlight a couple of them. The Pearland office south on 288, just past the Beltway is one of our newer offices. Um, we have a new flagship Bel Air office, which is on Newcastle and Bissonette. That is separate from the Skurlock Tower, uh, Houston Methodist Central uh, Medical Center office. And we also have Brenham, Livingston, Lufkin, and then sort of our, uh, Offices have been around a little bit longer, like Katy, Sugarland, Wharton Memorial, and Pasadena Space Center, and Kingwood. Uh, next slide. This is our flagship new Bel Air office of Redding Consultants of Texas. It opened in February 2021, right about the time of the freeze. The address is 4460 Bissonette. Again, it's on the corner of Newcastle and Bissonette. And what's nice about that is it has easy access to 59 and easy access to 610. So we are on the second floor and it's easy parking. You know, a lot of our patients are older. And so Skurlock Tower, the medical center can sometimes be a problem winding up the, the parking garage and paying. This is free parking. If it's raining, there's a covered uh, walkway. You walk across and it is free and an easy in and out. And we have a basically 16,000 foot huge area that contains both our clinical entities and, uh, and our research entities there at Retin Consult of Texas. There's frequently as many as three doctors or four even there practicing at one time, different days of the week. And listed, you'll see uh, the MDs that are there uh, in general. And next slide. Very excited about the new Memorial Office. We've been in our old Memorial Office, which was um, just across the street from the Memorial City Mall on King's Ride, and it was time for a new office. So we're moving very close by just across I-10. So it's on I-10 and Gessner, brand new, larger office, state-of-the-art facilities. It's a first floor suite with a surface level parking garage. So patients, it's an easy in and out, uh, which is also free. The doctors that will attend this memorial office, which opens in a month again, Dr. Benz, Dr. Brown, uh, Dr. Henry, Rosa Kim, Dr. Wynn, and Dr. Wyckoff. And again, those are our doctors that mainly were at the Memorial Office before. So they're just basically going on the northwest side of the street. We're on the northwest side of I-10 and Gessner, sort of catty corner across from Memorial City Mall, near our old office, but bigger and nicer space. Next month. Next slide, please. So this is an exciting uh, tool that you've heard me talk about before. And this is, again, the sort of brainchild of Sarah Barbatano, our, practice of, our director of practice management. But it's 
It's the Retina Consultants of Texas Image Portal. So this is a HIPAA compliant, I, I can stress, HIPAA compliant means to communicate back and forth. So you can send us images, we can send you images. The old days of the, of the blurry fax or the, or the picture with your phone are gone. Uh, so that's easy to do. It's a very short registration. You see the website there, portal.retinaconsultantstexas.com uh, slash register. So you quickly register there. Very short and easy registration form. Sarah Barbatano confirms your email and login, and then we can talk back and forth. And so we can begin sending reports to you and you can send reports to us. And again, it is HIPAA compliant. You can use name, date of birth, images. It's not only just fundus photo images, like an optos image, but it's also OCTs. You can say, hey, I'm not sure, is this, might this person have a bullseye uh, maculopathy because they're taking Plaquenil? I'm not sure. Send us those fundus autofluorescence as well. It's all there and all capable. So again, it's a very quick and easy log on. And then once you have it, you're done. And we can back and forth. So that's again, the Retina Consultants of Texas image portal. Uh, very easy setup. Next slide. And I'd like to introduce our first speaker tonight. This is Dr. Eric Chin. Uh, and he is speaker one of three to show you some cases that you have sent to us. Take it away, Dr. Eric Chin. Okay, can you guys hear me and see my screen here? Yep, okay, great. All right, again, thanks James for the introduction and thank you um, all of you for attending. We really value uh, your partnership and thank you for entrusting us to help take care of your patients with you. And so again, like James stated a little while ago, so these are all cases that you guys have referred to us. Um, and so I get to, to lead off tonight. And so, um, so the name of my title, the title of my presentation is Many Ways to Skin a Cat. And so I didn't want people to be confused that, that I don't love animals or anything like that. So those are two of my, my little puppies there. Um, but I named it this because in retina, a lot of stuff that we do, you know, we talk a lot about our clinical trials and the research that we do and, you know, very good evidence-based medicine um, for many things that we do, you know, taking care of macular degeneration and diabetes, vein occlusions, uveitis, so on and so forth. But for some areas of retina, there's not that many, there's not sort of established, I guess, uh, protocols or paradigms to treat certain patients certain ways. And so I just want to go over one of those uh, examples tonight. So this is not a diagnostic dilemma, mine isn't, but um, so my first case, this is, a, this is a patient referred by Dr. Jared Chen. Um, this is a 38 year old male who came in a little bit earlier at the, this year at the end of 2020. 38 year old male with decreased and de discolored vision, and he complains that objects appear smaller. His medical history is unremarkable. He's not on any medications whatsoever. It's not allowing me to, oh, there we go. Okay, great. So this is, um, these are the OCTs, pictures in the autofluorescence when he first came in. Um, and so this is in December of 2020. And so you can see that uh, on the OCT, he has a lot of subretinal fluid here. And so this is um, partially what's responsible for his vision complaints, which was sort of the micropsia, the, the dyschromatopsia and the metamorphopsia as well. Um, and so on, fun, on the autofluorescence imaging, you can also see right around the central macular region there, there's a sort of area of discoloration there that um, corresponds to the area of subretinal fluid. And so we get a fluorescein angiogram. And so you can see there's a couple, this is an early photo of the right eye. You can see a pinpoint little spot right over there. And as we proceed with the angiogram, you can see that pinpoint spot doesn't do anything, but over here, slightly off to the temporal aspect of that, you can see a little bit of fluid and a little bit more fluid and a little bit more leakage. So by the end of the angiogram here, we have a pretty classic smokestack. And so this is actually pretty rare. It's a very textbook uh, example of leakage in CSR that we, that we all um, studied when we were in residency and fellowship. Uh, but in actually, in real life, we don't see it that often. I can't remember the number of times I've seen something this classic, but this is one of the few times. 
So central serous retinopathy is, you know, it's characterized by accumulation of the subretinal fluid in the macula. Patients come in with a central scotoma, metamorphopsia, dyschromatopsia, and micropsia. And so on the fundus examination, we see fluid underneath the retina, sometimes a PED. And a recent thing that we've been noticing more um, with the advent of OCT and better imaging is thickened choroid. And so if you look in the textbooks, patients are typically males between the ages of 20 and 50. They have a type A personality. We always ask them if they have any kind of steroid exposure or testosterone supplementation or, you know, sort of what are life stressors and if they smoke. But as always, there's always exceptions to the rules. There's, there's certainly lots of females that we see with this condition and even, you know, outside of the typical age range as well. So I guess the thing that I wanted to discuss a little bit more tonight is CSR and when to treat this. And so um, typically this is a self-limited disease. A lot of you guys probably see these patients, you know, pretty often where they come in and they have spontaneous resolution of the subretinal fluid over the course of several months. And typically for us, um, we'll consider treating them if they have chronic CSR, meaning it's lasting more than three months, or if there are certain occupational needs, if they're an airport, airplane pilot or something else where they have to see very well, very quickly, we may consider sooner intervention. Um, because long-term fluid accumulation can damage the RPE and the photoreceptors and lead to vision loss. So um, this is where I want to get some of my, my esteemed colleagues involved and in CSR, how to treat it. Um, of course, there's observation, um, there's focal laser, and there's PDT. And so PDT is something that, we, that I'll most commonly employ when I decide to treat it. Uh, the whole idea is that it can um, target leaky blood vessels by closing or sealing them with doing minimal or less damage to the coral capillaries, depending on the settings that we use for the PDT laser. I know some of my colleagues also uh, sometimes will use some drops as well. And so we can discuss that. I'm happy to jump in. So in this case where you have a pinpoint leak, there are literally 10 lasers in the United States that have laser guided LASIK. In other words, the LASIK guided laser to laser point guided. It's called a Novelos laser. Of the 10, we have two. One in the Woodlands, one in TMC. This is a perfect case to Novelos laser. You're going to hit that point. It's going to fix it. I love PDT. It's the only, it's the only treatment that really works in a randomized trial. But just got a letter yesterday. We're going to have no Visudine from June to December. They're changing the production. Uh, BNL is not going to have access. We said, okay, give us 50 vials. They said, we'll give you four. So I don't know what we're going to do. I mean, we're scrambling to see if we can get PDT. I get all the PDTs from Louisiana. There's not a PDT machine in Louisiana. It's the best treatment. Drops don't work. Nothing else has been proven. Everything else is placebo. I'll let my partners argue that. So how many, thank you, Dave. So how many of you guys would treat this patient at this point? He's a 38 year old male, first time coming to see you, his vision's minimally down, maybe 20, 30 or something like that, and he has that subretinal fluid. Would you guys treat right away or would you guys wait? Wait. I give him the, I give him the option. Wait. If he's truly asymptomatic, I wouldn't treat him. But if he's symptomatic at all, a laser there with a Novelos laser is safer than walking across this and it. Anybody else? I would say if um, it's an acute onset, you know, it depends on how symptomatic the patient is, of course, but um, a lot of times these can resolve on their own. So sometimes I would just, you know, give them like a good discussed observation as one of the options too. Great. So when I was talking with this guy, I mean, like I said, his vision wasn't down that much. It was maybe 20, 30, but he was, he was sort of high strung a little bit. And so he wanted to, um, do something about it relatively quickly. And so he did have a lot of subretinal fluids. So I said, you know, let's plan on possibly doing a laser, you know, let's, but let's check it back in a month and see how it does. And if it's not any better then we can consider a laser at that time. And so this was him a month later, you can see it's about six weeks later there. And the fluid is, is significantly better. There's a lot less of the subretinal fluid, but the patient was, he actually came in and he, he thought it was worse. And so a lot of times the patient's I've noticed they're, they're not that accurate with their description of the symptoms along with the disease process. So a lot of them, even after we treat them with a PDT or a laser and make the fluid go away, they'll be like, I don't feel like I'm seeing any better whatsoever. And a lot of times there is some damage to already the outer retina and the RPE. 
Um, but a lot of times, like I said, like this patient, he, he thought he was actually worse, but this is six weeks later. So of course, at this point, you know, I, we talked him out of doing anything else. We said, you're, you're clearly getting better. And then this is another two months after that. And you can see there's just a sliver of fluid left. And then the final time that I saw him recently, um, complete resolution of all the fluid. So we, this is one of those cases where even though he started out with a lot of fluid, we didn't have to treat him. And so this is another patient. Um, this one I think was referred by Dr. Quinn Lee. Um, this was back in 2019. And so this is a patient, uh, I saw him, he was, I, I think he was in his forties or something like that. Um, and he did not have a lot of subretinal fluid. You can see he has sort of minimal amount compared to that first patient. And so um, I don't think anybody would elect to treat him at this point. Followed him a couple times. Um, and then this is when we saw him uh, a little bit later. So this is almost seven months later, and he still has a little bit of fluid there, not much whatsoever, um, but he's still complaining about it. So at this point, we did go ahead and decide to treat him. I did treat him with PDT. And then this is basically a, a month and a half after that. And you can see that that resolved all its, on its own. A lot of times, I think when we treat patients with CSR, it's, it's hard to tell if we actually did something good or the disease process itself just sort of worked its way out. But at any rate, in this gentleman, he'd had it for a long time. He'd had it for at least seven months with, with symptoms, even though they weren't severe, they were enough to bother him that he wanted to try something. And so this is my last uh, case of CSR. And so this is back from September of 2019. So this is a gentleman I saw um, with tons of subretinal fluid and you can see it's in bilateral in both eyes. And on the color photos, you can see on the right eye, it's a little bit easier to see. He has a very large area of sort of discoloration there, just um, including the macula and the mostly temple to it. And then on the other side, it's a little bit harder to see, but he also has pockets of subretinal fluid there as well. On the fluorescein angiogram, you can see in both eyes, he has sort of bilateral um, multifo multifocal uh, spots of leakage. So just going back uh, really quickly. Um, is John so any other meds? Of, what's that? Is John any other meds? This is unusual to have that many leaks, right? Yeah, he was not on any other medications. Again, all three of these patients, that I, they were all healthy, no other, no other issues, no other risk factors for CSR. And this was the first time I had seen him. Oh. Um, he hadn't had any previous treatment for CSR either. At this point, what would you guys, how many of uh, my partners would treat or what would you treat with? Or would you observe? So um, Dave's gonna, Dave's gonna uh, bark at me, but you know, somebody, multifocal cases like this, and I've seen these in Hispanics, Asians, and such, you know, they, a few of them have done well with a plan around, uh, which is one of the, what you're gonna talk about, um, you know, in your next slide. But, um, you know, if, if PDT, sometimes when it's diffused, it's hard to pick out where you're going to do PDT. And uh, I sometimes will give them a trial of a plan around and, and uh, I've had a few respond, but it could be placebo. So Tian nailed it. I mean, so I would give them Tic Tacs, right? <laughs> I mean, there's the, 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 the British trial show that placebo did. Uh, yeah, I know, I know. The, 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 you know, but, but you have, it's I have the yeah, I, mean, I have a few hate patients that you know they they I put them on it, it goes away. They they go you know I, I try to tape wean them off, and then the the fluid comes back. And it, you should have you, know, you should have substituted Tic Tacs. Tic Tacs, like, yeah, yeah, Tic Tacs is better than a plenum. Yeah. They would have been fine. I I I agree with I agree with Tien. I think there are some patients that works, and there prior to the Lancet study, there were other studies suggesting it did work, and the Lancet study I think was underpowered too. So yeah, so high, you might not have had a high enough dose, right? Or the right drug. There are higher yeah, yeah, they they way underdosed it. They they're like half the dose you're supposed to take. So those are great discussion points, and you guys already covered a lot of what I was going to just briefly mention. But I, again, with CSR, we think there's a role of steroids, and so there's a the thought that um, a mineral corticoid receptor antagonist could maybe, um, you know, help in situations of CSR by decreasing the leakage. And so this if it's was a male and they like gynecomastia. It's a great drug. <laughs> <laughs> so again, this was the guy when I first saw him and this is a month later on the drug. And so I, 
I very rarely have used epiplerone just because I haven't really seen it work in, in many patients when when patients start when doctors started using it a couple of years ago. But this guy, because it was multifocal, because it was you know pretty significant in both eyes, I tried it, and this was him a month later. So again, you know, we sort of mentioned some of the side effects there. There are definitely side effects. You got to monitor stuff. Um, and then, like we said, there are some studies about it that were retrospective with fewer patients and shorter follow-up um, while people were using this. But then in 2020, as my partners also mentioned, Lancet, you know, did a study on aplerinol for chronic CSR. Um, and then their conclusion was, quote unquote, aplerinol was not superior to placebo and ophthalmologists who currently prescribe aplerinol for CSR should discontinue this practice. Again, like we said, there may, it may have been underpowered. Maybe they didn't dose it right. Maybe they didn't, you know, they measured BCVA and that usually doesn't improve anyways. But in certain situations, I think it still has a role. I think like Tian and Chris suggested. And so in my patient, this is a month later after we'd seen him and there was complete resolution. I, we stopped the drug and then, you know, you can see it start to come back. And so this could have been coincidence, but I don't think so. I mean, it started to come back. I haven't seen him since then. So he's been lost to follow up. So maybe he got better on his own. So if we can get PDT, why wouldn't you PDT him? I think because he was, he was, he was doing so well on this. And so, I mean, it was easy for him to take the pill. I mean, I've PDT some patients that have multifocal and I'll just do multiple spots and it does, I've seen it work. Um, but I think for this guy, I mean, he was, he was happy just taking the pills for however long he took them. If there are no other questions, any other questions or comments? So we presented a case on a different conference last night. Amy can comment, you know, MEK inhibitors, which is very commonly used now in metastatic melanoma and others. That's what that appearance looked more like with multiple spots. So there's a carbon monoxide poisoning. I always ask them, there was an outbreak at Texas A&M in one of the dormitories where they had CFC because uh, they, you know, because they had carbon, chronic carbon monoxide. Uh, there are other, so ask about carbon monoxide poisoning, ask about, are you on other drugs? Are you on cancer chemotherapy? Amy, your thoughts? Yeah. I mean, I think it's a great point. There are these CSR like syndromes with certain drugs, um, namely, um, MEK inhibitors and other, um, inhibitors of certain, um, parts of the MAP kinase pathway that can give this, these very similar syndromes that usually have these like many small multifocal pockets and the drugs are more commonly used for both most of the metastatic cutaneous melanoma and metastatic non-small cell lung cancer. So just remember to take a really good history about what drugs the patients are on. Um, and with those conditions, they're a little different in that the patients don't have a thick choroid and typically you have to stop the drug. So it's a different, a different treatment approach. So you can see in this patient, all that you don't have a you don't have an EDI, but central serous for the past 15 years has been known to be due to a thick choroid. So what PDT does is kill the choroid. So I agree with you. You don't want to kill the choroid or thicken the thin the choroid unless you don't have to. That's why 90% of retina specialists call it central serous choroidal retinopathy instead of CSR, which was the old term. But I, you know, see us, if we get PDT, I think it's pretty innocuous. I do a lot of PDT. One, one point I would make about PDT, I think, is that I think a lot of people were afraid of PDT for a long time because in the original registration trials for PDT, there was, you know, one or 2% rate of choroidal ischemia, but that was in patients with AMD who have a thin choroid. I don't know what the rate of choroidal ischemia is in CSR patients, but it's damn low because they have a thick choroid to begin with. So it's pretty hard to yeah, so I don't snuff, so snuff I, out their choroids. Rick Spate, so back then we couldn't see the choroid. You know, we didn't have OCTs back then. And so that's why we don't know who we hurt. And in retrospect, we think we hurt people with skinny choroids. So if you do it, if you do a uh, OCT, especially an EDI, it, uh, enhanced depth in imaging P OCT, and they have a thick choroid, I don't think you can hurt them. Rick Spate has right. been doing this since 2001. I started three months later. I went to half dose because when people weren't getting paid for it, and I was giving with you a free PDT off the AMD doses. Uh, you know, I think we're going to have to go to half dose tomorrow to try to to try to keep our PDT supply going to the end of the year, and it works really well. So, it's a core problem. What's that? 
There's a question on the on the on the chat actually about that. Rick Baker, does insurance cover PDT? So Aetna does, Blue Cross does, uh, Medicare does not, but most of those patients are over 65. And it's in those patients, it's often a combined AMD slash CSC. And if you see if, if the PDT works, it was CSC, but we don't sell Medicare, but we stop giving injections. So everybody's happy. Uh, there's only a few insurances that don't cover it, and there is a copay assistance program. So, Eric, there's one more question. Do you want to answer on the? Um, let's see. Where is it? What is the mechanism for a thickened chloride being related to CSR? I think. I mean, I, I don't know that we completely understand. I mean, the thickened choroid, the thought is that I think there's hyperpermeability in the choroid for whatever reason, if, if it's congestion or some kind of inflammation or ischemia or something like that. And so that's why, like, like Dave said, we, the PDT works because we sort of kill off part of the choroid or we sort of make it less permeable. So it's just published this month, but Rick Spade and I published a paper. The, the choroid is drained by the vortex veins. And the hypothesis is that there's a starling resistor. In other words, something that determines the pressure. Because if you take, uh, if you take an eyeball that has a pressure of you know, 14 and you up the pressure to 100 by injecting something in it, the pressure of the choroid stays the same. And so there must be some kind of resistor that maintains choroidal resistance. Uh, he calls it a, like a startling resistor, like you see in the heart and the brain. And we think there's one in the vortex veins. It's hypothesized. But the hypothesis would be that it's kind of like a temperature regulator. Theirs is set wrong so that the pressure in the choroid goes up and they get a thick choroid. We think that's the mechanism of what we're seeing in space. I was just with the NASA people all afternoon. Thick choroids in space are probably due to increased venous pressure and not due to the Starling receptor, they actually get it from backflow. But people certainly on steroids, certainly on chronic Viagra, although most of those patients are older and have thin choroids anyway, but there's a lot of things that can thicken your choroid. And I tell patients that the retina is not stuck to the back of the eye, it's sucked on by a pump. So if you have a big juicy blood supply, it's easier to overwhelm the pump. And we think that's the mechanism of why CSC happens. But we change it every two or three years, so we could be totally wrong. So, All right, I think next we have V. Thank you. Great cases, Eric, and great discussion. Um, I have a different uh, case, so we're going to change gears a little bit. Um, let's go forward. This patient, um, I had the privilege of taking care of. Um, the patient was referred by Dr. Lantran and Dr. Lori Shulman in Texas State Optical and Katie. Um, so she's a 73-year-old female with gradual painless vision loss for about two weeks. She has a medical history of hypertension and high cholesterol, as well as anxiety. Um, she says that she's controlled on these medications here. She was a former smoker and she quit about a year ago and she drinks um, one to two drinks a day. Um, as far as her review of systems, she has no headache, no scalp tenderness, not really any weight loss. About a month ago, she had some tooth pain and so she had a dental procedure and that's where she's still having this jaw pain. Um, on exam, she is a 2030 in the right eye and she's light perception in the left. Her pressures are within normal limits and she has an APD in the left eye as well as complete um, loss in confrontation visual fields. Uh, the anterior segment exam is within normal limits except for um, you know, two plus cataracts. So this is the fundus photo of both eyes. And I'll pose this question to the attendees as well as um, my panel, but um, there's something about the left eye that stands out a little bit. Can anyone point out what they see um, in the left eye? I'll ask Dr. Patel this. Do you see any changes there that may stand out? So can you guys hear me okay? Yeah. So it looks like there in the left eye, there's definitely some uh, some whitening centrally. Um, I don't want to correlate that with an OCT, see if there's any swelling or anything like that. Um, hard to tell, but the nerve may look a little bit pale, and then there's some peripheral drusen as well. 
Got it. Yes, absolutely. So here is your OCT as requested. Um, so the right eye, the OCT is essentially within normal limits. Um, the left eye, you can kind of see this lucency and thickness and edema in the um, inner retina pretty much diffuse. And you can pretty much see it throughout the scan if I were to um, show you the entire um, video. Um, you mentioned the paleness of the optic disc. Um, Superficially, looking at you know the the map here, it looks pretty green and normal. But then, if you look closely, part of this is also edematous and swollen as well. Mm. And so, what other testing would you obtain now that she's in the office? And kind of you already anticipate you know getting the OCT, but what else do you expect to see? So, the next thing you're going to want to check is the flow. So, fluorescein angiogram is going to be helpful. Um, it looks like uh, there's some swelling of the inner, uh, so the retinal nerve fiber layer is pretty damaged there, causing like that, you know, classic um, cherry red spot. Um, so I'd, I'd want to do an FA to confirm the flow and see if there's any problems with the flow, really. Absolutely. All right. So this is the FA. You got it. And here is the actually the first time, 44 seconds, is when you see anything. I would show you the previous slides, but it's actually just completely dark. And so is this a normal time that you would expect to see flow, or would you say it's um, abnormal? No, that's definitely abnormal. Um, it's almost twice as long as you would normally wait. Um, and that's going to suggest that the, the dye is taking forever to, take, to, to perfuse the... Um, the, the retinal vasculature. It's hard to tell, but there might be some also choroidal ischemia. It looks like in the background, the choroid doesn't um, stain as well. You know, that should happen instantly. Really quickly, the choroid should have, it's called a choroidal flush where you get this kind of diffused light um, fluorescence of the background. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so possibly some patchy areas there. Um, so this is on to 54 seconds. And like you said, she has some staining of the periphery. Um, but really, it's more looking at the vessels here. And um, like you said, there were some disc changes. But here, there's a little bit of leakage towards the disc. And also, this tiny little vessel here, if I can point that out, um, suggesting of vasculitis. And this is the one frame that we have um, a little bit, um, one minute and 42 seconds of the right eye, just showing some staining. And so is there anything else, I mean, probably outside of the clinic at this point, but, you know, you mentioned some patchy quarter filling, some delayed filling, you know, she has an edematous um, RNFL, and also she has um, some inner retinal swelling, which with a cherry red spot, um, given her age group, you know, what, what other tests would you get? And this is for the panel as well, not just Dr. Patel. <laughs> I think someone answered it correctly, actually, in the chat. Yeah. Dr. Cheng, um, GCA. So you want to make sure she doesn't have GCA. Yes. And so the things that you can get um, pretty much right away is these inflammatory markers that we um, ordered stat. So ESR and CRP, um, two values which we um, got back. So actually the ESR was normal, but the CRP was maybe a little bit high. And so, you know, given the clinical suspicion of GCA, I went ahead and admitted her for steroids and also the work up, the stroke workup. Um, I'm going to fast forward uh, a little bit for the sake of the discussion, but she was started on IV steroids and then I had requested a temporal artery biopsy. This actually takes a few days or weeks to have done, but you can actually have them started on the steroids while you're waiting for the results. And so, um, Fortunately, got the results within a week or so, and it was positive for infiltration, um, lymphocytic infiltration with giant cells. So yes, I know that the mention in the discussion or the chat was that giant cell arteritis. So that's the topic of my discussion. Um, this is a vasculitis that affects medium and large arteries, and typically they have an internal elastic lamina. So a lot of times, you know, eye doctors are the first doctors that see these patients because they'll have vision complaints and really nothing else going on. And so you can have ophthalmic artery, occlusion, ciliary retinal artery occlusion, central retinal, and like Dr. Patel said, um, some choroidal ischemia. 
patients are typically 50 years or older. Um, it's very uncommon to see this in patients who are younger, um, and there's more predilection for female patients over male, about a two to one ratio. Um, usually they're coming in with some sudden or gradual painless vision loss. This patient had about maybe a one to two week duration. And sometimes they can report a history of some you know, transient vision obscurations or loss or permanent um, vision loss or even eye pain and double vision, depending on the um, which muscles it's affecting. Um, it's about, two, in some studies, 220 patients in uh, a million that is affected per year. And, you know, this is just something that um, can have various manifestations. So I really want to um, direct your attention to this um, slide here where we see AION or anterior ischemic optic neuropathy as a presentation, um, as well as posterior ischemic optic neuropathy. You can have the arterial occlusions that I mentioned. You can have episodes of, you know, vision loss lasting, you know, seconds or so, and then resuming um, the cotton wool spots as well, indicating these micro infarcts of the nerve fiber layer, uh, which should always be worked out. Uh, double vision, depending on their involvement of the muscles, and then sometimes even these peripheral um, retinal hemorrhages or um, signs of flare or iritis could be presentation as well. This is a, a picture which we, we discussed already of a cherry red spot, and this is kind of a, the central retinal artery occlusion picture there, but that's the key word. Um, oftentimes, as eye doctors, we're you know, looking at the eyes, but I would encourage you to um, you know, look for these other signs and ask these questions and do a complete review of systems. Patients who have headaches, you know, this patient said that she had some jaw pain, which she thought was due to the um, dental procedure that she had. But, you know, because of that, I, you know, was pretty suspicious for GCA um, because you, you really don't know. And she had the surgery about a month ago. So why would she still be having jaw pain? She didn't really have scalp tenderness, but patients can come in with that. And of course, she had lost a vision. Um, if you look at arteries, um, the superficial temporal artery, such as you see here, um, this absolutely is, um, you know, pretty obvious, but a lot of times patients don't have these presentations. So other ways you can tell are to um, palpate the temporal artery and assess for the absence of pulse or pain, you know, especially when patients are combing their hair or um, touching the scalp and also an absence um, or nodules. You can have other um, areas of claudication, such as in the extremities, so sometimes the arms. And so because it's a systemic vasculitis, you may have fever, night sweats, or weight loss, which are nonspecific symptoms. And then um, a lot of times they can have overlap with patients with polymyalgia rheumatica. And so in these patients, they'll endorse a stiffness of the neck or you know, other joint um, pain like shoulder or pelvic girdles. So this is a biopsy um, sample of a patient who actually has um, GCA. Um, the control is on the left-hand side of the screen. And I just wanted to show here that the lumen is nice and patent, the space here, um, in comparison to the lumen of a patient that has complete infiltration with these giant cells. Um, and the lumen now is very, very narrow. So that's essentially where you know, the blood is flowing out of. So that predisposes patients to um, ischemic episodes. The American College of Rheumatology classification, um, interestingly, says if you have uh, the presence of three out of five of these criteria, you have a 93.5% sensitivity and a 91.2% specificity, uh, specificity for GCA. And so interestingly, um, the first three, you don't have to have any labs. You know, you have ESR and then you have a biopsy, which um, oftentimes, you know, can help to guide the diagnosis, but, you know, if they're in the right age group, if they have, um, you know, endorsed headache or head pain, or they have this um, temporal artery tenderness or a decreased pulsation, you want to be thinking about GCA. This is a representative a slide of an MRI, which our patient actually obtained because she, um, you know, had a stroke workup as well. But in fact, in her eyes, she did have um, this enhancement of the perineural sheath and the optic nerves. And so it shows that she had early involvement of her right eye. And so I think it was very, very crucial that she um, 
uh, received her steroid treatment when she did, because, you know, it could have been um, pretty devastating if she had lost vision to the other eye. And a lot of times, you know, you have to really manage the expectation is that the steroids are not going to help, you know, improve the vision in the eye that already has vision loss. But what's very important is to prevent um, the sequelae of the contralateral eye. And so with correction, she's um, 20, 20 minus a couple of letters. Um, she's count fingers in the left eye. You know, sometimes she says she, see, she sees a little bit better, but really um, that eye is stable. And she's now on prednisone. Um, typically, we follow the inflammatory markers, CSR and CRP, in order to um, assess whether or not she can be taken off the steroids. But a lot of times patients are on it for quite a long time. And, you know, the steroids are not... Um, Without consequence, they can often cause, you know, osteoporosis, you know, other other problems like um, weight gain, you know, high sugars, and so a lot of these consequences will continue to um, be monitored by rheumatology as well. So I'm still seeing her, um, and so I was just glad to be able to be a part of her care. Um, but I wanted to open up to the panel to see if there was um, anyone who actually has seen different presentations of GCA aside from the one that was presented here. Yeah, I thought that was a good talk. And one thing I would add is that Actemra is FDA approved for uh, the treatment of GCA and that can help minimize the complications of long-term steroid use. Anyone else um, seen any other presentations of GCA or, um, you know, where they see the vision actually, um, you know, changing with steroids depending on when it was implemented? I think most of the time you've lost the ball game, right? I mean, sometimes you get a branch retinal artery occlusion or something that doesn't affect. Once you get a central retinal artery occlusion, I think you've lost it. Uh, you know, I think you did a great job. Anytime you have a 60 year old over the age, you know, with an artery occlusion or transient visual loss, they need a stroke workup. And part of that's the GCA. We ask about the jaw pain. You know, you talked about the labs. The, to me, the C-reactive protein is the, is, the, is the real deal. The SED rate's often elevated due to other things. I think you did a great job. Uh, we're gonna move on to the next case because we told everybody we'd be out by eight. So. Great case, thanks V. Uh, V's our young superstar and we love having her. So. Chris Henry, another young superstar. Go Uveitis. You're on mute. Officially unmuted now. Love it. All right. All right, I'll move quick. So the, the title of my talk is, Where Do I Begin? All right, so this patient is a 28-year-old Hispanic female who has a four to five week history of progressive vision loss. Uh, she has a past medical history of a condition called brucellosis uh, and is on no medications and on a review of system uh, endorses a headache, ear pain, and unexplained weight loss. So her vision was pretty bad, hand motions in both eyes with a pressure of 15 in the right and 24 in the left. Uh, she had granulomatous KPs in both eyes as well as uh, extensive cell and flare, uh, focal posterior synechiae and a clear lens. So here was her impressive presentation. So in the right eye, you see uh, essentially like a total retinal detachment. And in the left eye, it's even more prominent where you have a total rep retinal detachment where the, the retina is almost up against the lens, essentially. So, so the next thing we do is look at a B scan. And um, so uh, you may notice here that the choroid is dramatically thickened and we have essentially a funnel shaped retinal detachment uh, where we do not see a break or tear in the retina. And uh, very similar findings here in the left eye. Again, a funnel, funnel shaped retinal detachment and a severely thickened choroid. So when I saw this, this is this is what ran through my head. Oh dear, not good. Where do I begin? So I was like, you know, this is a pretty bad case. How do you, how do you try to get this patient better? Um, and so 
you know, first thing, first, first thing with a bad uveitis, you want to rule out infection. So I did a culture just to make sure this wasn't a, a viral process, a bacterial, fungal, uh, just kind of standard cultures. And um, I sent this patient to the ER. And so I did a kind of extensive uveitis workup. We got a chest x-ray. We got an MRI of the brain in orbits which later led to doing an LP. And then I had this patient started on high dose IV solumedrol, uh, one gram daily. And we actually had her admitted for five days uh, and then aggressive topical drops. And then, you know, because we're still kind of ruling out infection at this point, um, you know, I also covered her with antivirals and antibacterials, um, antibiotics, pardon me, um, uh, to sort of cover yourself. And so the cultures did come back negative, uh, laboratory eval, uh, uh, the usual players were unremarkable. Uh, we always test for syphilis and TB, which were negative. I did with her weird history of the brucellosis, just out of curiosity, I checked that and that, that came back negative. And uh, interestingly, her MRI showed uh, that she had a swelling of the optic nerve, but no enhancement. And then this led to us getting an LP, which showed pleocytosis, which is an elevated white blood cell count of the spinal fluid. Uh, but the protein, protein was normal and all cultures of the spinal fluid were negative. So um, this is how she looked at one week after bombing her with IV steroids. So it still is better, but it's still pretty bad. So basically we can see maybe a 50% improvement, but we still have very severe serious retinal detachments, but at least we can see the retina at this point. Left eye, similar picture. We're to counting fingers vision. There's still subretinal fluid under the macula, as well as this sort of fibrinous uh, subretinal fluid. Uh, the one, one thing that's a lot better at this point is the choroid is much less thick. So we've, we've shown progress there, but we still have this turbid uh, subretinal fluid. So we made some progress, but we're still in trouble. What can we, you know, should we, what should we do next? So um, I actually got this patient over to early steroid sparing therapy, uh, which included starting uh, biologic infusions in her case, Remicade concomitantly started her on methotrexate in conjunction with a rheumatologist and then started um, a very long, slow oral steroid taper. And I gave her sub tenons Kenalog injections in both eyes. And uh, by this point, the, uh, there's a lab you can do called class two HLA typing, um, where there is one uh, that looks at your DRDQ typing. And there's one uh, subtype that's seen more commonly in, uh, with VKH, uh, which she turned out to have. So here's how she looked at four weeks. And we finally, finally starting to turn a corner. Uh, there is still quite a bit of fluid inferior, uh, but the vision has improved to 2,400. Macula is not entirely flat, but we're pretty flat at this point, almost flat, just, just a few more microns and we're there. Um, and so the question at this point is just how aggressive to be, do you, do you trust your systemic therapy, your steroid injections? Um, and so I actually, I decided to be a little more aggressive. I gave her steroid shots into the eye at this point. Uh, we, we kept her on the heavy immune suppression uh, decided not to externally drain and it eventually worked the the fluid flattened at so this was pardon me at three months she was 2200 but as we uh, so we are flat at this point and then um, kept her on the high dose immune suppression slowly tapered the steroids at at nine months she's 2060 uh, so at this point she would be in what we consider the convalescent uh, phase of vkh where we're starting to see some retinal and choroidal depigmentation. Uh, but we are starting to get a little bit of photoreceptor recovery, 2060 in the right. And amazingly, uh, she's 2040 in the left, and uh, she is able to resume her um, normal activities to a certain extent, not able to drive. She doesn't, she's not quite safe to drive because of the peripheral field loss, but she is able to, to hold a job and do most things. Um, and so hopefully those photoreceptors and, uh, retina will continue to recover. Uh, so this was a this was a case of VKH, probably the most severe case I've ever seen. And um, she meets the uh, she she technically would meet the criteria of a probable VKH, 
uh, where she has no history of no, no history of penetrating trauma. Uh, she has no clinical or, or laboratory evidence of other ocular systemic diseases. Um, the condition's bilateral with a bilateral choroiditis. Um, she's got an ultrasound showing diffuse choroidal thickening. Late stage, she had kind of developed that sunset glow fundus. And then she did have neurologic findings, including the uh, tinnitus. Um, she never, uh, at least thus far, has developed any skin findings, um, such as um, vitiligo, poliosis, or alopecia. Um, so this was a, a severe case of probable VKH. Um, and uh, thank you very much. Hopefully we hit our time and I uh, can take any questions at this point. Chris, that was that was pro also probably the, the the most impressive case of VKH I've ever seen as well with this with the serious detachments. How I don't remember how long had she been symptomatic. I mean, how long did it take her to get to that point? Yeah, so she 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 got referred a little bit late. So she she had had symptoms for about five weeks. So I think it I think if 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 a patient like if you catch a patient sooner than that, you, you can get a better visual recovery. So I, I do think if you treat early in VKH, you can have a better long-term outcome, but it, in her case, it had been brewing for about five weeks. So if you have a, if you have a bad bilateral pan uveitis, especially if you see any subretinal fluid, we, you know, that's a case we should see early. But she, she did recover. So so, so all is, all is, all is good. Wow, Chris, fantastic and a very difficult case. Well, so we had great cases, central serous chororetinopathy, giant cell arteritis, central retinal artery occlusion, and then a really bad, nasty VKH. So <clears throat> I hope you all enjoyed the presentation, the CE tonight. And we wanted to show you two final slides and then we're done. One is how to contact and how to refer a patient to Retina Consults of Texas. There's three ways to do it. Number one, the old fashioned way, call 713-524-3434, speak to a human, let them know what you need. There's always a physician on call 24 seven, holidays and weekends. Number two, online, retinaconsultantstexas.com slash refer a patient and just fill out the form right there online. Or number three, fill out the form basically and fax in a referral to that number you see below. So call online or fax are the ways you can reach us. And again, we, we sort of pride ourselves on, on being available. Uh, so anytime you need us, uh, please let us know, contact us. And I, I know you're, next slide, please. And I know you're wondering about, well, how do I get my CE credit? You basically don't need to do anything. Your CE credits, you're, you were captured via Zoom, so you're all set with that. We, Sarah Barbatano here at Retina Consults of Texas, will submit the one hour uh, to the TOB. Be on the lookout for upcoming courses in July and August, and then probably skip September and go to October. So the dates will be announced and there'll be Zoom meetings like this. And any questions about your CE or how to get it, or if there's a problem, please contact uh, Sarah Bartano at the number uh, at the end. Everyone have a wonderful, safe summer on your travels if your kids are out of school. And we look, we always look forward to doing these events. We think they're, they're great. I always learn a lot and I hope you do too. And thank you for entrusting your care of your patients to Retina Consultants of Texas. We truly appreciate it and are thankful for it. Thank you all so much. This concludes the scene.